So hello, and welcome to this dialogue regarding mental health, well-being, and skills for life for our youth generation. I'm Maya. My name is Sydney, and we're lucky enough to be joined here today uh, by Alejandro Alder, who, Adler, who is a, uh, a PhD in psychology from University of Pennsylvania, and you've worked with Columbia as well as uh, the is Upper Canada College as well as the UN for Sustainability, as well as Ali Pekka. Who is the man very much holding the future of our education in his hands, the IB General Director. Welcome. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. During this dialogue, we would, you know, of course, like to go into your work because you, of course, you're doing stuff that are very relevant for what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we would like to, you know, go into mental health, both the you know, how it's of worsening right now for a generation. Like we're going to like to go into some of the tendencies we're seeing right now, um, but also to go into resilience and of some of the, you know, solutions we can provide for that because, you know, after all, that's why we're sitting here now today. Um, and you guys are more than welcome to comment, question and so on during the process. But we've, you know, prepared some questions we'd like to ask for you. And then otherwise, let's see how this thing goes. Perfect. So first, we'd like to start with some foundations of the mental health crisis that we'd like to be discussing. We all know that there is a mental health crisis within modern youth. That's, that's easy to see. It's clear through facts and statistics that we can analyze. But as Maya previously stated, something we really want to emphasize in this dialogue is that this mental health crisis does not mean this is not a resilient generation. This is a generation of political engagement and global awareness off the charts from, previous, um, from any previous generation. So first, we'd just like to hear your perspectives on the current mental state of the modern youth. You can also, I'm, 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 it's the, in the same lane, I'm just going to ask a follow up question to that afterwards. Like, when you're out there, because UWC to an extent, you can argue that it's a bit of a microcosm. So when you're out with your work, what do you see youth like fighting with? Where are the problems that you're like facing out there? <laughs> Should Please. I start? Absolutely. So um, COVID-19 essentially started three years ago. And initially, it was deemed a physical health, public health crisis. Mm -hmm followed by an economic crisis, but in the work we've done with the United Nations, with the World Bank, with the Inter-American Development Bank, we've seen that it's brought about a mental health crisis as well. Mm -hmm. The levels of depression and anxiety amongst adolescents and young adults has increased at an unprecedented rate. Um, a significant driver of this is the lack of connection that youth had during this now almost three year unprecedented phenomenon. But we also see, as you said, Maya, and you said, Sydney, uh, an unprecedented um, willingness to engage with the world. And we've seen that in the countries where we've worked with uh, governments to embed skills like resilience and other life skills ranging from mindfulness, self-awareness, emotional literacy, effective communication, uh, critical thinking, uh, and, it's, and mostly the ability to build resilient communities, those youth populations have been to a great extent inoculated against this mental health crisis. So we do see that the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have indeed globally created a mental health pandemic, but we do see that there are specific life skills that are measurable, that they're malleable, and that they're teachable and learnable, and that they're meaningful, and that they contribute to well-being, they contribute to academic performance and other desirable life outcomes. And not only do they make youth resilient to bouncing back to a baseline level of well-being, but they actually actively promote well-being. They actively promote healthy relationships, positive emotions, meaning and purpose in life, a sense of accomplishment, empowerment. So we do know that there is a constellation of skills that we can teach explicitly and implicitly in the curriculum, pedagogically, 
that empower youth to not only bounce back from the enormous challenges of the pandemic and other challenges in their lives, but they actually actively uh, not only allow youth to be um, to be reactive, but to be proactive about their well-being. Um, so you spoke about the impacts of the COVID pandemic, specifically in terms of isolation, which I agree with you on. And I wonder about your opinion on the impact of technology and the connectivity that we have in the modern world and whether that has a positive or negative impact. So one of the silver linings that we've seen from the COVID-19 pandemic is leveraging ICT. And yes, it's a double-edged sword in that it has isolated people, but it has allowed us to digitize a lot of our pedagogical and curricular materials and reach many more educators and students to promote these skills, not only again of being reactive and resilient, but to actively promote well-being. Thank you. Uh, well, I do agree and share the view that Alexandra was saying about the impact of the pandemic, but I think it's also Fair to say that the deterioration of mental health of young people started before that. That it is a trend that we've been seeing there for a longer time. Um, I spent last summer, two days of my summer holiday, reading research and surveys about the well-being and mental health of young people that were done recently. And uh, it, it was a it was a shocking experience. Kind of reading, there was a Bath University survey, for example, on, with 10,000 young people from 16 to 25, saying 75% of them saying that future is a scary place for them. And there were kind of too many people who were believing that life will come to an end during their lifetime. And, and that's kind of, it, it really is something that the education system cannot kind of close its eyes with that kind of, uh, kind of attitude. And, and therefore, um, and it, it kind of, with the pandemic kind of, kind of uh, strengthening the, the mental challenges, uh, it has really kind of taken education systems a bit as a surprise because mm -hmm. it has happen happened in such a short time. And I think now is really the question that what are the measures that we can do? Exactly. Um, and, you know, when Sydney and I, we look at it here, you can look at, you know, in terms of mental health and well-being, there's like a, you know, the psychological aspect of it is, you know, what's going on inside our heads and our young in our young vulnerable brains, but also, you know, the system, the educational system that these young heads are sat in. Um, and to like something that I, as a student, kind of have a hard time, you know, differentiating like to and from like which parameters do we like twist on? Like what are we, where are we helping first? You know, is it from, are we taking a structural systematic approach or are we, you know, teaching resilience to individuals in a sense. And I think we, you would like to go more into like how the IB factors into this, right? Certainly, yeah. yeah. We have a specific question for you discussing the challenges facing mental health. You've recently published an appeal more directed towards teachers about uh, the threat of teacher burnout and overworking. And you think the solution to that is radically reworking the way that we uh, teach well-being to teachers, giving them new skills and lessening the workload. And I was curious on how your perspective of that um, correlates with your position as the head of the IB, which is famously one of, if not the most work heavy pre-university diplomas. Do you think that, uh, where do you think the intersection between valuing the well-being and personal, uh, personal wellness of students takes precedent over academic rigor? And do you believe that those two can work together? And Alejandro, I know your dissertation was on a similar topic of how well-being can create uh, higher academic scores in schools in Mexico, Peru, and Bhutan. Bhutan. Bhutan, thank you. Yes. Mm. So I'm sure you can give some input on this as well. Yeah, I think that's an, it's a very, very good question. 
because what, what I'm seeing, and there's research on that done also where, where I come from in Finland, that the question of um, kind of having issues with mental well-being isn't always about the thing that you kind of get stressed, but it can also be a development that comes you being bored, you being kind of not having challenges that you are kind of uh, suitable for you. And, and, and that kind of, because sometimes when we talk about well-being, there's the idea that let's lower the bar. Mm. And I don't think that is the answer. But, but of course, we have to be thinking when we're talking about assessments, we have to think that what are the ways that we can uh, kind of, in, in that sense, take the consideration of the burden that they create uh, in consideration when we are developing the assessments. But it's, it's a lot of it is also about what is the teaching and learning, the pedagogical solutions that are there, that are the things that are taught and the way they are taught, are they meaningful for the young people? Is there a connection with the student and the world on, on questions that, that kind of uh, make a difference and are motivational for the young people to learn. And, and then it's also the question of the kind of whole school culture that is it kind of supportive and does it include the idea that every student has a voice and is heard in that community I, which is central, but I think at the end we come to the very difficult question where kind of our generations have to look into the mirror uh, very honestly and ask that how we created a world for the younger generations that they feel dif difficult to cope with. Yeah, to, to paraphrase your point, would you be saying that academic rigor and challenge could almost be a stimulant for well-being rather than a depressant as long as that rigor has meaning, as long as it's something that like those experiencing it find impactful and meaningful and worth their time? I would say so. If it's kind of, if the, if the kind of challenges are on the right level, that they are achievable but and and in that sense motivational and and on the, but on the other hand that they require you to go after them thank you alejandro do you have any additions yes absolutely and when we bring up the idea of promoting well-being and well-being skills in educational settings whether it be a whole school or a regional local or a national government policy there's often a resistance of we have lags in literacy, numeracy, science, and so on. We do not have space for well-being. And our research has consistently shown that well-being and academic performance are not only not mutually exclusive, but they're mutually reinforcing. So when you invest in the well-being of educators, first and foremost, and as a downstream effect in the well-being of students, there is better teaching, better learning, and better academic performance. So even if well-being as an end in and of itself is not a justification for educators and for students, the consequential outcomes of well-being leading to enhanced academic performance and other desirable life outcomes tells us that well-being has instrumental value. And what we've also found enormously beneficial in terms of motivating students is connecting the curriculum to the sustainable development goals that were adopted by all 193 countries, member countries of the UN in 2015. And at Upper Canada College, for example, we have a design department where students are empowered by choosing one or two SDGs that they are passionate about, let's say poverty elimination and environmental sustainability and through programming, 
through product design, through digital literacy, developing well-being skills of effective communication, team building, critical thinking, creative thinking, problem solving, and solving real world problems through project-based student-centered learning that simultaneously enhances well-being, engages them and motivates them in their learning, and as a result, also enhances academic performance. So we've seen that investing in well-being yields higher academic outcomes than investing in more hours of homework, more hours of tutoring, and so on and so forth. I really agree with the, you know, we need to tweak this entire saying that you know, success leads to well-being. You know, it's the other way around, that well-being actually leads, leads to success. Um, and I can see here our timer says that we only have two minutes left, probably a bit more. Um, but I would like to go into a bit of this, you know, pressure that is being, you know, spoken about a lot that our like young generation are feeling in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. performing and presenting. And, you know, we're being faced with this. Some people would almost call it too many opportunities or, you know, we're talking about, you know, there's talk a lot about how privileged our generation is and how, you know, good we're having it. So at the same time, I personally feel like there's, you know, this shame connected to almost then why are so many people feeling so bad? Um, and I would, you know, like to go into that a bit more. And then also because we need to get to some solutions. I know you've worked with, you know, how you can implement some of these structures at like higher structural levels, like governmental as well, right? Um, and regional, I think. And the, here the IB, of course, also factors into this. Um, so I guess maybe we, we could look at a story of success, like a concrete one of how you've worked with concrete, like implementing these these things that we've talked about to kind of take on from this, this dialogue. Yeah. 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 Just to add on to that, you know, we've proven that there's not just uh, there's not just a connection, but that positive correlation mm -hmm. between well-being and academic success. And um, you outlined different, it, it, you used for your examples in your dissertation, you used different examples of well being and different teachings in different areas. But uh, with Maya's idea of a concrete example, could you give us maybe three of the most practical that we can apply basically anywhere, either here in the IB or in any of the schools you previously worked with, to increase that well being and therefore increase that academic capacity? Absolutely, Maya and Sydney. So the first place we implemented this was in Bhutan because they measure gross national happiness rather than gross national product. So there was already a political will to advance well-being. In Wales, I know there's already a policy for well-being. So beyond justifying well-being as an end in and of itself, its instrumental value of contributing to academic success, it's also a policy and strategic goal at the Welsh um, and, and Wales level. So um, what we've seen is number one, work with the coalition of the willing at the policy level, um, make it a participatory process mm -hmm. so that educators and students have a sense of ownership over what well-being means, what why is it important, how do we measure well-being, and then most importantly, how do we translate well-being into curricular, pedagogical, and administrative practices to actually increase well-being, which translates into academic uh, performance. So I think just like Bhutan has the enabling, had the enabling conditions and continues to have, and it's now a national program because of its gross national happiness rather than gross national product. In Wales, there is a policy for well-being along with economic growth that I think creates the enabling, the enabling conditions to pilot a well-being program here at UWC Atlantic. Do you have any additions on how we should perform well-being either as students or just general people in education? Well, I think like for, again, my generation, uh, I, I cannot say that I know how you feel about the situation where you are. Mm -hmm. So I think what is central is the intergenerational dialogue. Mm -hmm. to to kind of to understand uh, what is the world that you have been born to and where you have grown up and and to through that kind of a dialogue also that what are the things that you would uh, want from us older generations and kind of um, it is kind of I, I don't want to say to you that be resilient but I, I want to hear that, what is it that you 
think that we could help uh, in order to make it kind of uh, that the well-being level that you're feeling in the world better. Uh, I think that kind of we have created a lot of good things in the world. Mm -hmm. Things there are a lot of things that are better than earlier, but we have also simultaneously we have created created new challenges and new pressures, as you were saying, mm -hmm. and 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 that those challenges cannot be met really differently or but only with kind of all the generations together trying to do their best to solve with them and cope with them if i can add just one more thought please we've replicated uh, our programs and policies in 18 different countries and we've seen that the real access points to changing whole school or whole school systems psychosocial cultures are educators and if we teach educators not just to learn and teach well-being skills but to actually live them practice them embody them it changes the traditional hierarchical system of a teacher and a student and you have genuine mentors in the room who will walk alongside students students feel seen feel heard and there is a genuine dialogue taking place in the classroom. And so my, if I had one suggestion, it would be train educators to actually practice and live these skills because they are the psychosocial nodes of cultures within a school, within a school system. And that's also, you know, really, you know, the time is almost up, but it's also a really beautiful way of like furthering this, you know, cooperation or like I really recognize for myself this like longing of, you know, like some role models in a sense that, you know, like mean something and that actually have the courage to walk in front that you can like stand by and stand for because we're being talked of as this, you know, generation of future change makers, but I'm a you know, 18 year old teenager, of course, I can't just walk in front. So that's a really, really good point. And I think that's a good way of, you know, furthering this intergenerational dialogue. Um, and I think our time is about up. Yeah, if I could just say one final point to Ollie, I really liked what you said about um, what our generation can ask for from, yes. from either your generations in collaboration or from the greater world. And I think we really settled on those key points in this discussion of challenge that is not challenge that is meaningful, challenge mm -hmm. that feels purposeful. And that's what will build that resilience, those connections and that passion for all the engagement and political causes that we see the youth today mm -hmm. engaging in. Like, the, the mental health crisis does not limit the youth. And in fact, we can, we can not just fight it, but we can turn it and create it, exactly. create something that is purposeful. Exactly. And we can create something that drives us instead out of well-being. And such a good thing that Festival is a hope where, <laughs> a Festival of Hope is a place where, you know, these questions and queries can actually be listened to. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. Thank and you so much. I have one you question so for you, if I may. Yes, please, which go. Which is in an ideal situation where an educator becomes a mentor and a role model, mm -hmm. what questions would you have an ideal mentor be asking of you mm -hmm. as students? Ooh, that's a good question. I've been privileged enough to have some pretty fantastic teachers within my life and some pretty fantastic, what I would consider mentors in my life out of those teachers. And I've always found that the, the greatest way that they could encourage me was through exactly what you were talking about, Ollie, was not through coddling me, not through giving me an easy way out, but rather giving me something to fight for and almost be angry about, be passionate about and drive for. So encouraging that, that fire within the youth mm -hmm. with compassion and empathy, obviously, and like awareness of, of limits and other complications. But I've always found that the mentors whose lessons have stuck with me the most were those who encouraged me to be more and do something greater with my life and to have purpose. Yes, um, I think from my point of view, like I've always longed for, you know, mentors that can kind of help me, I guess, unlearn some of the norms that have been like put down at me. You know, there, there are certain, you always say, or like I have heard a saying of uh, this author from back home that says, don't always believe what you think, which, makes sense in this like, in terms of like youth and pressure set, like setting that we were talking about before um 
because when these like thoughts and norms come up with all these things that I feel like I should be doing as a young person and like what my generation should be able to accomplish I think I need you know this grown-up voice to kind of challenging me a bit on that one and you know helping me how to unlearn some of these norms and patterns so I can become just what I expect of myself instead of what society expects of me kind of if that makes sense mm -hmm. absolutely that's beautiful yeah thank you both so much this yeah. has been a wonderful so conversation yeah. pleasure thank you. thank you for joining really. us